This week's blog post is part one of my favorite recommendations from 2020. In 2020, I emailed 157 art-related items to members of my free Sunday recommendations list. To join, just email me. The email address is in the blog post. For my supporters, I recommended 51 more items. The items in this and part two of this post are my own personal favorites. Among them are 17 items that were originally shared only with my supporters. So under literature, for novel, my favorite one this year was Mary Renault's The Praise Singer, 1978. Renault is one of the great writers of historical fiction, and she sent many of her works in ancient Greece. The main character in this one is Simonides of Chaos, circa 556 to 469 BC, a lyric poet in the period when mainland Greece and the Greek colonies in Ionia, Turkey, were under the rule of tyrants. One of my favorite passages is this one, quote, tell a man what he may not sing, and he is still half free, even all free if he never wanted to sing it. But tell him what he must sing, take up his time with it so that his true voice cannot sound even in secret, there I have seen is slavery. There are two runners up. The first is Randy Wayne White's Doc Ford Sanibel Island series, which began in 1990. I'm on the 15th of White's 26 Doc Ford novels. Doc Ford is an interesting, complex man, notable for his honesty, courage, and integrity. Occasionally, he speaks an excellent and truly thought-provoking line, such as this one. In any conflict, the boundaries of behavior are defined by the party that cares least about morality. End of quote. I came across White's books at Doc Ford's Rum Bar and Grill in Sanibel Island, where the author lives. They should be read in order. And the other runner-up is... Dorothy Dunnett's Dolly and the Doctor Bird from 1971. This is my favorite mystery by this author, whose works assume a high level of attention and intelligence as opposed to many modern novels that require a high level of toleration. Dunnett also wrote several multi-volume historical series. I blame her Lemon Chronicles for the fact that my German is nicht so gut. Those six books in the Lemon series seriously distracted me the summer I was taking an intensive course in German. Next up in literature, drama. My favorite this year was the Terence Radigan play While the Sun Shines from 1943. This was Radigan's longest running West End play. I've uh, given you the link to a nicely done BBC Saturday Night Theater reading from 2020, assuming the YouTube date is accurate. One review calls this work effervescently escapist. You'll know if you need some of that just now. Also under literature, my favorite short story this year is Henry Kitchell Webster's The Second Rescue from 1916. It is a romance, sort of, set in the Great Lakes. This will appear in the third volume of Webster's short stories, which I have coming out in 2021. Under the heading of poetry, I found this another difficult category to narrow down. Tied for the winner are Sir George Etheridge and Sarah Teasdale. The poem by Sir George Etheridge is to a lady asking him how long he would love her. It is not Celia in our power to say how long our love will last. It may be we within this hour may lose these joys we do now taste. The blessed that mortal be from change in love are only free. Then since we mortal lovers are, ask not how long our love will last. But while it does, let us take care each minute be with pleasure past. Were it not madness to deny to live because we're sure to die. And the Teasdale poem is called Tonight. The moon is a curving flower of gold. The sky is still and blue. The moon was made for the sky to hold 
and I for you. The moon is a flower without a stem. The sky is luminous. Eternity was made for them, tonight for us. There are one, two, three, four runners up in this category. One is Quint Cordaire's Toast. Second is Henry Lawson's The Men Who Sleep With Danger. And the third is Sarah Teasdale's Wood Song. There are links to all of those in the blog post. The fourth is a Victor Hugo poem, whose title translates to A Jean Was Sentenced to Dry Bread, 1877. In 1871, Hugo became the guardian of his grandchildren, Jean and George. One of his last published works was The Art of Being a Grandfather. In the late 19th century, children were still expected to be seen and not heard. Judging from these poems, many people were shocked by the way this towering figure in the literary and political spheres indulged his grandchildren. This poem is one of my favorites among his shorter poems. In the rough translation that follows, I've tried to keep the terminology of the criminal courts, which is used in the original Shades of Jean Valjean. Although it's slightly stiff in English, I've also kept Hugo's use of the French on, one, rather than he or she, because I think it makes the authority figure, who might be a governess, a housekeeper, a butler, rather more forbidding. The poem is in rhyming couplets, but of course the syntax of English is so different from French that a literal translation loses much of the fun. For example, Hugo rhymes forfaiture, penalty, with confiture, jam, jelly. So here's my translation of this poem. Jean was sentenced to dry bread in a dark room for some crime or other, and failing in my duty, I went to see the condemned one while she was still suffering the penalty. And against the rules, I slipped her in the dark a pot of jam. All those in whom, in my city state, the good of society reposes, became indignant. And Jean said in a gentle voice, I won't touch my nose with my thumb. I won't let myself be scratched any more by the kitten. But one said indignantly, This child knows you. She knows just where you're weak and lax. She sees you always laughing when one gets upset. No exercise of authority is possible. Every moment the system is troubled by you. Power is relaxed. No moral order. The child has nothing to arrest her. You demolish it all. And I lowered my head and I said, I have no answer for that. I was wrong. Yes, it's with such indulgences as these that one leads the people to their doom. Let me be sentenced to dry bread. You deserve it, certainly, and one will impose the penalty. Then Jean, in her dark corner, said to me very quietly, raising her beautiful eyes, full of the authority of gentle creatures, All right, then. Me, I'll bring you some jam. And we move on to painting. My favorite work that I recommended this year was Caspar David Friedrich's Woman at a Window from 1822. This is a lovely work by a German romantic painter. Google sees a lifeless room and a woman longing for the unknown, but I see calm curiosity. The runner-up is Pascal Campion's Room to Grow, a collection of images and stories from 2019. Campion, a graphic artist, usually works in Photoshop. I like the sense of life of many, many of the hundreds of drawings that are illustrated in this glossy 9 by 12 inch 200 page book. Campion has a wide variety of moods, but he keeps coming back to things that matter to me, such as balancing work and life, love of family, relationships, sources of inspiration. The book includes occasional page long answers to questions and comments that Campion hears most often. A lot of current material by this artist is available on Campion's Instagram feed and on his website. Sculpture is another difficult category for me to narrow down. The winner, because it's been among my favorite sculptures for a couple decades now, is the Zeus of Artemisium, 
which dates to around 460 to 450 BC. This Zeus shows a fabulous view of man because to the Greeks, gods were just larger than life men. It was found in a wreck off of Cape Artemisium, north of Athens, so its modern name has the happy effect of recalling the emergence of the glorious Greek classical period. At the end of the 6th century BC, mainland Greece was a collection of small city-states. Then the ruler of the Persian Empire, having expanded from modern Iran into modern Turkey, arrived in Greece with a huge army and navy, intending to swallow it up. In 480 BC, the Persians defeated the Athenians, Spartans, and their allies on land at Thermopylae and on the sea at Artemisium. Then they rampaged south through Attica, where, among much else, they destroyed the sculptures on the Athenian Acropolis. The Persians were finally defeated by the allied Greeks in September 480 BC at the Battle of Salamis. Throughout the 5th century BC, the Greeks frequently referred to the defeat of the Persians in their literature, art, history, and public speeches. And they didn't think of it as merely a military victory. The Greeks viewed it as the triumph of order over irrationality. The Persian ruler had absolute power, and most of his soldiers were slaves who had to be whipped into battle. In contrast, the Greeks were fighting for their freedom, for a local government in which they had some say, and for their way of thinking, independent rational thought rather than the dictates of a religion or a tyrant. After the Persians were driven out, Sparta resumed its former isolationism, and Athens became the leader of a defensive alliance formed against future Persian attacks. It also became the cultural center for all of mainland Greece. The confidence that the Greeks found after defeating the Persians showed in every detail of the multitude of artworks that were created over the following decades to replace works destroyed by the Persians. Among those works that they created were the Parthenon and its sculptures and the Zeus of Artemisium. One of the runners-up is Simon-Louis Bouquet's Archimedes, 1788. This is a wonderful portrait, sort of, of one of the ancient world's greatest scientists, mathematicians, and engineers. This work earned Bouquet his admission to the French Academy. Given the quality of the composition and technique, it can't possibly have been his first work. Given that he lived another three decades, it was probably not his last but I've been unable to find any other works by him on Google, in English or French, on the Louvre's database or in the Frick Library's database. Benizy, who is a famous source for art history, mentions only this sculpture. Wikipedia in French notes four bas-reliefs at the Hotel de Salme in Paris, which I haven't seen photos of. This is all very perplexing. Could it be that all the knowledge and achievements of mankind are not yet on the internet? Another runner-up, Desiderio da Settignano, Portrait of a Little Boy, sometime around 1455 to 1460. Donatello often created works that were passionate, violent, or thought-provoking. See, for example, his Mary Magdalene, Herod's Feast, and his Bronze David but one of his most influential works was a simple marble relief. After centuries of medieval artists showed the Madonna and the Christ child as awe-inspiring figures, Donatello in his Pazzi Madonna showed them touchingly and very humanly as a mother and her child. The Pazzi Madonna sparked hundreds of paintings and sculptures in the sweet style in mid 15th century Florence. This exquisite portrait bust in the National Gallery in Washington is an example. Desiderio's contribution is the extremely subtle rendering of flesh, hair, and cloth, and that tremulous expression that looks about to change to who knows what. For more on Donatello and the Pazzi Madonna, see Innovators in Sculpture, Chapter 8. Another runner-up at the upper left is Henry Hudson Kitson's Minuteman in Lexington, Massachusetts, dates to 1900. This sculpture is later than the more famous one in Concord by Daniel Chester French, and I find that I prefer it. Upper right is Bartholdi's Christopher Columbus, Providence, Rhode Island, 1893. 
Imagine seeing this sculpture for the first time without knowing who it represents. What do you see? I see a person with an upright bearing looking into the distance with a slight frown, but pointing ahead as if he'll move onward despite his worries. To my mind, it's about courage. It is, of course, Christopher Columbus, and I prefer this version, with a hat tip to Sam Axton on Facebook, to the many Columbuses in New York City. The original version was designed by Bartholdi and cast in silver by the Gorham Manufacturing Company of Providence, Rhode Island, as a celebration and a display piece for the 1892 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. The bronze version, a gift from the Elmwood Association to the City of Providence, was placed in Columbus Square in 1893. When I moved to Connecticut in August of 2020, I looked forward to being able to see this in person. But alas, Columbus was defaced several times in the decade of the 2010s, and in June 2020, it was removed in the wake of the George Floyd protests, hauled off to an unknown storage site. A number of people who would not have had the courage to do what Columbus did stood around and clapped. For my comments on politics and portrait sculptures, I've given you a link to an article in the blog post. And finally, Nicola Salvi and others, the Trevi Fountain in Rome, 1732 to 1762. Sometimes you just need exuberance combined with a high level of technical skill. Baroque artworks from around 1600 to 1750 are very good for that. Think Vermeer, Velazquez, Rembrandt, Kalf, and of course Bernini and Caravaggio, whose works started the Baroque movement in sculpture and painting, respectively. By the mid-17th century, painters and sculptors had available in their toolkits almost every innovation that had been or would be devised, and their works are remarkable. That level of skill lasts through the 19th century, with considerable variation from 1600 to 1900 in what artists consider important enough to represent. For more on what happened in the late 19th century, see Seismic Shifts in Subject and Style, as well as Innovators in Sculpture and Innovators in Painting. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my many other obsessions. To join the free Sunday recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on dianedrantywriter.com. Thank you as always for listening.